In this episode, I'm joined by Colby Dickinson, who is an associate professor in the Department of Theology at Loyola University, Chicago. In this episode, we discuss his book, The Fetish of Theology, The Challenge of the Fetish Object to Modernity, alongside discussions on desire, faith, theory, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support Amenics, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep everything running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Colby Dickinson, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Yeah, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, we are going to be discussing your book, The Fetish of Theology, The Challenge of the Fetish Object to Modernity, which was published just last year by Palgrave Macmillan. And this is a book which is really dealing with, as people would imagine, uh, fetish objects, the idea of fetishization with objects, idols, icons, what we imbue in these objects with relation to theology and belief, and how this is all, you know, what does this really mean in the modern world when we've we've established a relationship of sort of self-understanding, right? We've entered the meta level of the object to the point where we can say this is a fetish re- relationship if one if one wanted to, you know, what happens when when you sort of you're calling an icon an icon, right, in a way. Um but before we begin, you know, with this, just tell us a little bit about um yourself and how how this book came about. Yeah, sure. And and thank you again very much for having me. Um, so I'm a, I currently teach uh, at Loyola University in Chicago, and I, I work there on the borders between theology and philosophy. So I do a lot of continental philosophy of religion would be sort of a main area I'm focused in. And this particular book came came to my interest because I was looking at a number of political theological issues and wondering how exactly are we able to have theological ideas that seem so speculative and abstract, how are they so embodied quite frequently throughout history and often with deep political resonances? And the idea of the fetish came up because I was working with uh, different theologians who were using notions of sacraments. And when I came across discourses on fetishism, I was almost shocked to find out that there was really no overlap Uh, No one was talking about, at least in theological circles, no one was talking about fetish objects or fetishism. And I thought this is very interesting because it's such a central, you know, conceptual discourse that pervades Marxist theory and critical theory. And why is this something that theologians are not just loath to take up, but almost completely, you know, uh, hesitant to take Mm -hmm. up in so many ways? What's that about? Because there seems theoretically to be such an overlap. So because I was working on political theology and trying to understand what it means to do a self-reflexive theological study, which almost seems like something that never happens, you know, I thought, what does that look like? What is that going to be like? Um, And I wanted to see how we could put fetish objects in conversation with sacramental objects and what that would do. So that's kind of the thing that that first tipped me off to this being a possibly interesting subject uh, to study further. Okay, okay. Well, obviously we're going to jump into fetish objects in a little bit, but before we do so, I have to ask you the Hermitics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? I loved this impossible question. (laughs) You know, I thought this would be a, a, a weird combination, but I would pick Hegel. Mm. whom I just, I would love to sit in here more from. And, and Fernando Pessoa, the Portuguese mm. poet. Uh, and then I thought I would try and see how that would interact with Virginia Woolf. I wanted those three <laughs> making such hopefully fabulous conversation together. So I've only read uh, the Book of Disquiet and I haven't read any of Woolf and I'm, I'm renowned as a, a Hegel hater. So this room this room is a, a tough one for me. It's a bit of a miserable room for me. Um, what, where do you where do you see where do you see that that trio is? What's the what's the thread that they're they're going to be discussing? Do you think? Oh well, I mean, obviously the the nature of reality. What what's underneath it all? And I think they have very different ways to get at it. But I think uh, I think for me, I love seeing the synergy that sometimes develops and takes place even when there's frictions and tensions between different worldviews. And so for me, thinking these three are coming at life from three very different perspectives, I'd love to see what synergy takes place and, and in a very unscripted way. I don't know as if there'd be any way to predict what kind of conversation would come out of that. So that, that almost mystical questing for what lies out there beyond what we can see before us. Uh, I, I feel like these three would have such a dynamic conversation, but that's, 
entirely speculative and they may hate each other and it goes nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the ultimate thing, which is really, it's almost a discussion which is happening in your book, right? Which is like, what happens when you, you deal with the reality of the thing? So it's all good in fantasy or, or imagination, or we'll get to Lacan, right? All oh, three figures. But the reality is like, well, you put any three philosophers in a room, they're probably all going to be pretty disgruntled and they're going to be like, well, why, why, why do I have to be here, right? You know? um, so, yeah. Basically, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, no, it's an interesting room. I I, I only really know of Pazoa and Wolf as sort of quite melancholic writers, so I don't know if that room would have a a solemn a solemn tone to it. Oh, I like that. That's one of the reasons I thought about putting uh, Haruki Murakami in the room as one of my three. I thought he could liven things up maybe a little bit. That'd be nice. Some jazz, <laughs> some cats running around in place. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That, his, his is like a positive melancholia, right? Like you, you sink into it. You're like, I just want to keep reading. This isn't too miserable. Oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. It's been, a, it's been a long time since I've read any Murakami. Mm, okay. Okay. Right. Well, <laughs> these figures will probably come back in. I'd have thought, especially Hegel. I, I'm going to assume Hegel will arise. He always does. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll begin with sort of a very basic question, um, which is, I guess it's, it's almost like a three-part question. I mean, what is a fetish? What is a fetish object? And what is the relationship of the fetish object to the sacramental object? Yeah, that's sort of very, very much the heart of what I'm trying to do in this book. So um, fetish objects, I, I became so, it was, sorry, fetish is, and then fetish objects became so interesting to me as I was reading through the secondary material about, you know, how different people read theoretically what the, exactly the fetish is or is not, because there's so many different definitions given of it. And I think part of me got to a place where I recognized, okay, yes, it is a moment of material transcendence of some kind. It's something within the material object that appears to go beyond the material object. So there's mm. like a, a special aura or there's some sort of strange glow to this object that attracts us. So that, when I say material transcendence, it's something along those lines. Um, but I also became very interested in how some people define it as kind of a, a physical object that expresses in some way uh, the cross pressures that we have no way of symbolically resolving. We cannot bring about a meaningful clash of symbols in our lives. And so this object takes on the properties of sort of this leftover remnant. The excess of meaning becomes embodied in this thing. So you think of even like Jean-Luc Marion's notion of uh, the saturated phenomenon. That has some, some resonance, I think, with this idea. There's mm -hmm. too many too many possible meanings that are present to us in our lives. And so this material object becomes a way to try to deal with it without actually ever being able to deal with it. It's, it's like a symbol of what we cannot deal with. The pressure is too much. It's too intense. I cannot suture these things together. Mm -hmm. I cannot make one meaningful expression. And somehow this object becomes the inert like presence of those impossibilities. Mm -hmm. So that was one, that was sort of the, a powerful way that I, I began to think about it. And then I was reading through uh, another source, uh, Hartman Bain's book on it, uh, a German thinker. And he talked about how for him, the fetish was theory. Mm -hmm. And and it was so simple, but it hit me so profoundly. I thought, okay, so the fetish of theory, the theory of fetish, you know, in many ways he began to conclude Part of the reason we've developed the fetish as a conceptual idea in the modern period is that we're trying to theorize everything. So out of this, you know, colonialist Western way of thinking where anthropologists are traveling to, you know, quote unquote, foreign or exotic cultures and trying to see what they really believe. Um, we're trying to theorize all these things. And the fetish becomes also a way of theorizing things that, let's say, realities that are so complex, we can't actually theorize them in one standard way. So that becomes another layer of trying to understand what exactly the fetish is. It's also a theoretical intervention. So I, I give that example too, because that sort of draws a bit of a distinction between the fetish and the fetish object. It seems like a fetish can be sort of these pressures and symbols and even you know, theoretical speculation mm -hmm. that we hold on to, to try to identify reality or give meaning to reality, even when we're not fully going to be able to. And a material object or fetish object seems to be a inert physical reminder or placeholder that we're never going to be able to theorize, you know, fully. And this object somehow becomes symbolic of that impossibility. And we're sliding between those realms continuously. So that's, that's the first 
to sort of speak to your first two questions and how does that relate to a sacramental <laughs> object? Um, it seems in some ways that the history of, of theology in the West has been aware of this problem and didn't need encounters with, again, quote unquote, indigenous or exotic populations to understand it. It's, it's also been at the heart of Western thinking. And I think one of the main ways that comes out is in definitions or attempts to provide religious objects that are, again, moments of material transcendence that are also, you know, inert physical reminders, how we cannot bring a symbolic reality to its fullest expression. The thing I don't go as fully into in this book, but which I I certainly allude to, and I point to this directly in the conclusion, but um, it's also in the West grappled with quite a bit in terms of embodiment, Mm. that we don't know how to define our own bodies Mm. and our relation to our bodies. They become sort of also fetishized, inert, symbolic reminders that we cannot bring this mind and all these conundrums that are part of the human existence into an embodied material form without feeling like something's left over, something doesn't make sense, something can't be fully described. So it's also a moment of embodiment. And when you think about in the West, uh, Christianity, especially or in the Catholic tradition with sacramental presences, we're still trying to think through that relationship to our own embodiment and to the body and the brokenness of the body, the vulnerability of the body, etc. So that also plays a role in trying to understand how these things fit together. I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll do him justice. I already see a Hegelian synthesis here, right? So you have, you have this, you have the icon in the Orthodox or the Catholic tradition. Well, more the Orthodox tradition. The icon has the the, the presence of the saint, or you know, you 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 aren't praying to the object um, within Catholicism, as my own understanding. It's more of a symbol, a reminder of the person. But of course, in Catholicism and Orthodoxy, you do have the Eucharist, right? So there's almost a Hege- Hegelian synthesis in. You could have two approaches: an antithesis or thesis and i guess it doesn't really matter what side they're on but one is you just you allow it right you just you just lay back it it is it is the object that that we accept it is it is the the full presence but on the other side you're you're super critical it's still the object we we analyze it and your book's really attending to this in between within the modern world where both sides can't avoid each other right so you can't really talk about the 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 sacramental object without really understanding it as a sacrament because to do so would be not be to talk about the thing but on the other hand it's still it's still the object and so in the modern world i guess we, you know we we're talking about symbols earlier you know in the modern world we 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 we're all educated enough i think to just attend to things via you immediately can begin to pull things apart and deconstruct and look at them and this is probably quite a new phenomenon so in the modern world this whole idea of symbolism is almost immediately a meta symbol right you know it almost seems like back in the day you wouldn't say that's a symbol it just is whereas now it's like we know it's a symbol, but we still have to act in such a way that we aren't aware it's a symbol, which is a very difficult thing to do. Oh, yes. I, I, and I love your description. Thank you for adding that. That's, <laughs> I think it's a very rich way to think of it. And, you know, for me, I, I continue to think of it as you say, like a Hegelian dialectic of sorts. I do think we're permanently caught in between uh, sort of a Catholic and I, you were mentioning Orthodox and Catholic, but I think mm. of like a a Protestant mm-hmm. and a Catholic mm-hmm. view, because the Protestantism, when you look at the history of the Reformation, especially, it is centrally founded on iconoclastic acts, acts of trying to move away from the embodiment. We, we you know, we're not going to take a physical pilgrimage somewhere. We're going to do Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. We're going to go into our heads and we're going to just think about it in purely abstract terms. And there's this destruction of icons. And there's this, you know, we don't want the material reality to corrupt us and take us away from the true spiritual nature of faith. And yet, then you get the the counterpoint, Catholics digging in deeper and saying, no, we're going to dig in even further into the sacramental realities. And these material objects do matter. We do need them. And part of what I'm doing in the book, quite consciously, though it's sometimes the subtext, is recognizing that that tension is always going to be there. Mm. You're never going to fully be able to do away with it. The Protestant is not going to be able to do away with material reality, and the Catholic is not going to be able to do away with the need to, let's say, be iconoclastic toward their own material realities at times. And I think we have to acknowledge that. So one of the things I do in the book is to try and say every every quote-unquote sacrament it's also something we can treat fetishistically in, in a more, and here I'm using like a negative connotation, not that that's how I want to end my definition of it, but I think we tend to say the fetish in our popular language is a negative connotation mm. oh, and, sacrament, and sacrament takes on more of a positive connotation for a lot of people. I want to say every sacrament can be used fetishistically and every fetish 
could be potentially used sacramentally. And I think we have to understand the slippage between those things. There's not going to be a permanent resolution to them, which is also, of course, my, my reading of Hegelian dialectics. <laughs> so it, seems, it seems to me that there is, in a way, and it's a very modern, it's a very modern problem, almost, dare I say, the modern problem, right, which, which you could almost say most of the, the canonical big philosophical figures have been struggling with, which is, is imbued in this question between Protestant view of icons, between the Catholic view of these fetishistic objects, which is, it seems the quest is for authenticity. Right? What is the authentic thing? We're looking for the real, the real, quote unquote, capital R experience. We're looking for the real. And, and, and do you think I'm, this is, this is the impression I got from your book is this struggle of both sides saying what is authenticity because it's only through authenticity that we can say we're really doing something. Oh, yeah, completely. Thank you. That's a, that, you're reading exactly what I'm trying to get toward. Um, yes, I think both sides are trying to do that. And I think part of how I end and conclude this is to say, well, the only real way to do it authentically is not to simply uh, take apart critically your opponent's other, other way of seeing things. And I don't think it's also an antinomian stance. We're just going to do away with all attempts to form, you know, identities through our material realities. I think the only way to do this is to to see the sort of the quote unquote the failure of your own perspective. Um, when you can get to a space of saying, "I'm trying so hard to embody a material reality in my life in some way," so whether it's a sacramental object, a fetish object, but I see where I may possibly fail to mm -hmm. to adhere to this existence that I've created for myself in an authentic way. That's the only true path toward authenticity. I often think about how there's a, you know, both Giorgio Agamben and Judith Butler have said in their works at certain points, the only accurate representation of a thing is to show your, your inability to be accurate in your representation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, only, the only way to make a genuine representation is to show you failed to make that representation. Mm -hmm. But when you can show the failure, when you can show your failure, then you're actually achieving something. And I, and I think that that more or less is what I'm trying to do with this book in some ways. Yeah. No. That was such a that was such a huge and interesting point that you made. So you, you say that um, it's page 24, uh, any theological project that sought to expose the fetish of the theology, this would be its aim and focus to increase its own poverty at the same time as it continues to let go of its political strength. And this is in relation to somewhat in relation into Latour's text, uh, We Have Never Been Modern. I think that's the title. Um, I right. did a talk, I did I did an interview on it, so I should know. But Latour, you know, this idea <laughs> of the modern sovereigns aren't God, aren't these traditional sovereigns, maybe not even the state in like that Hobbesian way. The modern sovereigns are science, cap you know, capitalist science, money, economy. We, we draw these into conversations just like we all know this, you know, the economy. Okay, right, yeah, we're all agreed on that sovereign thing. All right, okay. And th this this idea that you've just said about something which ultimately, you know, like the, ob the fetish object is doing, is aware of itself, is critical of itself, but at the same time has to be that authentic sovereign experience. So it's a, an experience which is somehow critical and making itself, uh, you know, increasing its own poverty, but at the same time has to retain a sovereignty. I mean, this is really the position of Christ in a way. Uh, you know, I think of the Sermon on the Mount, it's the position of the things he's saying are sort of completely... Um, derailing which is why it's so revolutionary or, or radical derailing any potential for that notion of personal power right it's like here are the here are the rules here's how you should abide by the way this is nothing to do with me you know that i'm not tr i'm not trying to win anything which is like hey, wait what you know like almost second guess him because you think hang on he's not selling anything he doesn't want you know he doesn't just wants us to be kind to each other so you know how, how does that how does that such a thing continue to exist Oh, I think it's, you know, well, in the, in the field of theology, it's like the unwritten rule that you can't talk about <laughs> how we're always caught in that space, which is exactly as you mm. describe it. Um, I, I've, I've written also on the, the political tension within, uh, within theology between what I'm calling like the communitarians and the genealogists, it's what Alistair McIntyre sort of describes them as. There's, there's those who are trying to defend the sense and identity of community and of as you put it, of sovereignty. And they may not want to use the word sovereignty mm. because that you know that that's not sounding nice to use. And then you have sort of the, the more continental philosophical infused 
genealogists who are taking apart everything. And you almost get the feeling when you read so much of that world, even to use the word sovereignty in any way is a taboo and a no-no. You're not supposed to do that. Let's, let's deconstruct everything and it never stops. And yet, where, where do we acknowledge, where do we acknowledge that we're caught in a tension between these things that really we're never going to fully resolve mm -hmm. and, and our bodies become these moments where we can see so crucially that that tension is never resolved. We, like you just put it, we were, we're going to be sovereign over our own bodies and over our minds even. And if you're not, you, you run the risk of being schizophrenic or you lose a sense of self. You have to find a way to bring it together and say, this is who I am. And I'm going to make that, again, sovereign gesture. Um, but I'm also going to be able to take it apart at points. And I'm going to be able to see where there are problems. And I'm going to be able to lay on the psychiatrist's couch and, and describe where I failed to be what I thought I could be. And we have to acknowledge that that tension is never going to be ending. And we're to do that more honestly, more accurately, I would say is a step toward the self-reflexiveness that characterizes mm -hmm. us as human. So I, I love the way you described that. I think it was a very accurate portrayal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of that acknowledgement of, of the, you know, the, the, the postmodern or continental trajectory since the seventies really has been this idea of trying to deconstruct hegemonies and they've, to be honest, and I think they still are, or they're starting to come through, but they've been blind to the fact that in doing that, they've created an even more nefarious hegemony of deconstruction, which they begin from deconstruction. Sometimes that's, you know, especially in relation to things such as icons or sacra uh, sacramental objects, you think, well, if you begin from deconstruction, you're not beginning from the actual thing. Um, so it's that weird, like a hegemony of non-hegemony, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I always think of like, and, and my disclaimer from the start is I love reading Derrida. Derrida is fantastic. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful author. I love so much of his work. And yet I remember when I was doing research on him years ago, coming across an interview where he says, everyone thinks I'm I'm so anti-canonical. I, I want to destroy every canonical mm -hmm. form. And he says, but that's actually not the truth. I'm actually tempted to defend canons mm -hmm. and, and to argue we, we absolutely need them. But that interview that he did with Richard Rand was so rarely quoted or so rarely talked about. And it reminded me of a, a conference I went to with Derridians uh, where uh, one of the keynotes got up to speak and he, he said, we can deconstruct and deconstruct, but I am an architect and I have to build. And it was just like a gasp in the room. Like people were just shocked, like, oh my goodness, he's correct. What a profound point. <laughs> is this how is this how far we've gotten from that reality? We do have to build things. We do have to have a sense of self. We do have to have canonical forms. Um, yeah, I, I hear you on that. And yet I think there is such a value, and we've seen the value of deconstructing so many of our ideas but we have to return to to something and, and let's have an honest conversation about how we do that and what that looks like and what that should look like or what it shouldn't mm. yeah so to, uh, so this this is a huge question i mean with re this regard this idea of construction and, and searching and questing i guess is a probably a better way but for the modern for the modern person specifically um and you, you draw in a lot of lacan and freud which is very helpful with regard to this is you know, where, where does this desire for this, this authenticity, which is really beneath this questioning, where do you think this desire comes from? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, probably in some ways just from being human, but I think that's why it has a definite existential overtone. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the significant push in the 20th century with, with well, 19th to 20th century, if we're talking Kierkegaard uh, up to up through Heidegger and, and you see this in so many different existentialist thinkers to be authentic to be most genuinely ourselves you know how can we do that what is that going to be like um, I think we we've come to a head because we've realized in some ways we've lost sight of something of uh, the traditions that have guided the quote-unquote authentic human way of being in the world and I think in the modern period that became scandalous for some, liberating for others. And I think it became very difficult to talk about what then an authentic form of human existence is. So because I work on the borders of religion and philosophy, you know, that question of is the religious way of being in the world the most authentic? And in the modern period when that declines and people start saying that's not the most authentic, now the burden rests on the individual to discern sort of more or less for themselves where that authenticity lies. Mm. And I think there can be a real beauty to that questing for authenticity.
necessity, but it can also be the most vacuous word ever, as Adorno points out in his critique of existentialism. You know, what, he finds sort of this word authentic to be completely meaningless. Uh, either, either, you're living, either you're living according to a way a community has taught you, or you're living according to your own values, or you're not. Um, mm. I, I, think, I think authenticity rises up as, as a significant term in the modern period from existentialists on, because a lot of people are living without those traditional foundations and moorings and that they're wondering if I don't have something like religion to give me a sense of purpose and meaning, how am I living in connection to my own self and my own life? Is it then therefore authentic? So it's kind of a a secular question, I would say, Mm. or a question of the secular age in that sense. So what is the fetishized object or the sacramental object, which itself is, is or is not fetishized in relation to however one subjectively thinks? What is that representing in relation to this quest for authenticity oh that's such a good question i I would say it's probably something like um if okay if the sacramental object has existed as the object that's interrogating humanity but through a religious tradition specifically in a christian one and it's kind of saying here's how the authenticity does exist you are going to struggle with the question of embodiment and the question of overloading, you know, saturated meaning, et cetera. And we're going to put it in this form and this will help a person to deal with those problems in life. I would say the fetish object becomes a, a recognition in some of the permutations it takes in the modern period that meaning can't really be sutured as easily as we think it can. But we're also not aware of how to keep open these questions that plague us about our own authenticity. And so these fetishes in the modern sense uh, become moments where you're left sort of on your own, unable to suture together meaning, and you're wondering where where it's going to come from and how you're going to live authentically or not. Um, and these objects become things we're stuck to that are opening up for us horizons of meaning and question and say the impossibilities of understanding our own existence, but they become extremely individualized. So then people begin to develop their own quote unquote fetishes or attachments to different material objects that really speak to them about how they're not able to suture together the things they once were. So let me, because I think your question is such on such a fundamental thing. Let me just sort of recap it. Mm-hmm. I think sacraments had been part of a religious tradition of saying, here are the problems you're never going to be able to resolve. You Mm -hmm. need to be open to these mysteries. Again, sacrament just means mystery. You need to be open to these mysteries you'll never be able to fully understand. And when that leaves, when it recedes a little bit into the background of the modern period, people are left with the same questions about the authenticity of their existence, but they're not feeling like they're able to ground them in a tradition that speaks to them in the same way. And yet they're still going to have the same problems. So fetishes become, again, moments of mystery, and we're not sure what they're doing, and why am I so attached to these things I can't even explain, but they become extremely individualized. Someone becomes able to fetishize a commodity, another person fetishizes something in a sexual way, someone fetishizes, you know, whatever. Those things are also opening up presences of mystery and over-determinations of meaning, but they become extremely individualized, but they're still sort of the same problem that, that people have. It's, it's why I constantly go back to Adorno's comment about the moment you think you've destroyed a fetish, another one will appear <laughs> immediately. And I think for a lot of, let's say, more uh, secular atheistic perspectives in the modern period, they could say religion's nonsense, sacraments are nonsense. Um, we've destroyed those. But then rest assured, you've created more. You've just done it at a different level and in a new way. And that's, I think, what fetishism represents. The person who can say, I'm done with religion, but then they're going to turn right around and do something just as, quote unquote, silly as what they were condemning the religious tradition for believing in. Uh, But it also is illustrating their own struggle with meaning and openness and the inability to describe embodiment. And all those questions come back in these new fetishes. So I love your question. (laughs) (laughs) Do you you think that 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 quest ultimately for the modern person who has become critical really does always end in a sort of a disappointment even if they're mostly almost there you know in this full belief they can never really settle into full acceptance that it is what they say to themselves it is there's always an element of disappointment once the once once that recursive or discursive relationship is acknowledged there's always going to be that to use Derrida's language though probably wrongly like a trace of but I still, there's still that hesitation. There's still that disappointment. Yeah, that's why I think 
that question of the disappointment in relation to these material you know attachments that we have is so crucial mm. a lot of theorists of the fetish talk about how the fetish becomes for so many people an attempt to repeat something that can never really be repeated that's why you can never get enough of it so think of you know the commodity fetish you're never going to get enough you're you know but you're always trying to repeat filling in the gap of meaning filling in the hole mm -hmm. and saying i'm going to achieve a total understanding or i'm going to become authentic or i'm going to have the most authentic way of living my life it's going to be here but you're always repeating it so the fetish some describe it as a it's a failed endeavor every time the fetish is a a repeating failed endeavor to achieve the wholeness we think we're going to achieve if we can just possess that fetish object once and for all uh, and that's why we think it has the supernatural power, but it's always failing to do so. So we're always almost ritualistically repeating it over and over our, our effort to obtain it, to have it. And I think your question of disappointment is so crucial here because there's a certain, there's certainly a reading of sacramental objects or whatever those are or are not, but there's a reading of sacramental objects that is you're supposed to become actually, let's say friends, <laughs> acquainted with your failures and your disappointments you're supposed to realize your vulnerability and your brokenness through the sacramental encounter and and again that's sort of a positive connotation of the sacramental side and and then of course the negative connotation of the fetish is often you're just going to keep seeking it out over and over and you're never going to achieve wholeness you mm -hmm. but you're you're going to deny that very fact through the through the repetition to try and achieve the wholeness so Again, is it possible to regard a sacramental object in the negative fetishistic way? Yeah. And, and you, you refuse to, to encounter your vulnerability. And so you're not actually facing your disappointment. And then is it possible to go into the fetishistic and say, yeah, it's silly. I'm attached to these material realities. And they're so disappointing. They never work out. <laughs> and then, But to accept that and to accept the vulnerability of yourself through that attachment? Yeah, I think that's possible too. But doing so is very difficult. And I think it takes a, a psychologically stronger person to recognize that these objects we're attached to are never going to fully give us what we want them to give us. Mm. They'll never be a wholeness. So your question about disappointment is so crucial here. It's, it's such an important one to think through. Do, do you think that's why, I mean, early on in the book, you, you in fact, I think it's almost immediately you state that you, you sort of have this uh, problem with this very clear dif differentiation between the sacred and the profane as these two clear zones. Do you think in relation to what we've just been speaking about that in that sense, when you, when you just go, right, there's the sacred that that's sacred, that's profane. Really you're, you're almost escaping from responsibility. Uh, in a sense, maybe, I mean, that's interesting. I have to think about, am I escaping the responsibility of it? I think um, for me, the bigger question that I was interested in was mm -hmm. the one of to what degree am I willing to let go of whatever I had thought sacrality was mm. in order to actually encounter sacrality? And to what degree am I needing to be unafraid to go into whatever the most profane thing is to actually discover <laughs> whatever might be sacred within that too? Um, again, it crosses these borders between the two. I'm thinking of uh, toward the end of his, his very large book, uh, Less Than Nothing, uh, Slavoj Žižek talks about his reading of Agamben. And he says at some point, you know, Agamben's going on and on about how we need absolute profanation. You know, everything we think is sacred has to be returned to a profane status. Mm -hmm. And then he says, but I want to ask Agamben, basically, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Agamben, when you get to that zero degree of the profane, is that not also where we might begin to discern the zero degree of the holy or the sacred? And, and so for me, going into the space of losing sight of everything we had once thought to be sacred, is that not also where we precisely locate whatever the sacred may or may not be? Mm. And I'm thinking here, and I, I think I mentioned this at some point in, in this book, uh, if, if not, I write about it elsewhere, but uh, this idea of, you know, in, in the Christian tradition, the moment God dies, the moment Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain that you know divides the holy of holies, the most sacred space in the world, from the rest of the profane world, is torn in half. And I think this becomes a prime example of: Are we scared or afraid to take a space we had once thought was sacred and to allow it to be sort of profaned or desecrated? Mm -hmm. But does that not also open up new possibilities for what the sacred is, and and certainly how that sacredness permeates the world? And I think. Part of what's so beautiful about the sacramental traditions in certain forms of Christianity is that there seems to be a real unafraidness, you know, mm -hmm. a lack of fear, a courage to face the fact that what we have thought 
the sacred was is actually not what we thought this, you know, not actually the sacred. And what we had thought was profaned or not God, godly, is actually where God is. So part of troubling the border between the fetish and the sacrament for me certainly inevitably challenges the border between the sacred and the profane. And I don't read that as necessarily shirking of responsibility. I see that actually as the responsibility of anyone who dabbles in theology to say, well, we need to begin to trouble those boundaries. That seems to be the core of the message that comes out of at least, you know, the Christian tradition. So I'm speaking from that theological angle, which is what I was doing in this book as well. I mean, there's two things there. I mean, one in relation to this idea of the profane becoming sacred, or sorry, the sacred becomes profane, but also then the reluctance to sort of change the profane to the sacred. I mean, you know, the, the, the teaching of what the church is, right? The church isn't the building. It's actually technically not the building and the objects, right? Two or more gather, gathered in my name, I am there in spirit. That is sort of this, this the, the small congregation changes the space into something sacred. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that idea of suddenly something can become out of that experience and acceptance between parties that, yeah, this is a sacred space now. But equally, you know, just to bring in the Zizek, there's a brilliant, one of my favorite Zizek things, and I mention it so often, but in, in one of his interviews where he talks about um, the, the, the teenager rebelling by throwing stones through like a school window and I'm probably stretching the sacred and profane there, but that act of rebellion for any teenage uh, adolescent period of growth is sacred. It's like the sacred rebellion that's need, like needed for that. But then he talks about the fact that in the modern world, of course, the postmodern dialogue is that the teacher comes out and also grabs stones and joins in. And all of a sudden, the whole relationship of everything's infolded. And it's like the, 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 that inner impulse is destroyed. And that's almost like the, the risk that we're seeing here and what we're talking about is like, you know, as you said about, um, uh, what's the icon? It's like, it's theory. As soon as you enter into that relationship of theory, like what's happening, you know, what's being taken away, but what can also grow, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't even have too much to add to that. I think you put it very, very well. Like what, what uh, we need to, I think we need to become better at simply recognizing where those moments of challenge are happening and to acknowledge them and to try to sit in them and not try to give the answer to things and say, now I've resolved it. Now I've figured it all out. Here it is. And sometimes that's much more difficult than we want to acknowledge. And I think that's a beautiful part of doing, like doing my job for me is beautiful when I hit these walls and I say, I don't know how to explain this. I don't know how to deal with this. I want to, I want to use this theoretical grid that I've learned to give an answer. But the truth is I'm not quite sure how this all works out i need to be more honest with that in myself and that's a hard thing to do i think for academics and being quote-unquote experts and you know it's really hard to embrace mystery and things we don't understand and things we don't know so we don't need to we don't need to do a whole getting beyond the fetish i i don't think so no i mean i think for, again for me getting beyond whatever that means to get beyond the fetish it, it's only a negative procedure it's mm. only something i can do insofar as i show i have a failure mm. through mm. something i'm not able to achieve the identity i want to achieve and only in doing that can i actually achieve something so i don't need to get beyond so to speak i have to go back before mm. this is this is a very like, agambinian thing to say but i have to go back before this and not to achieve the origin or to find the real root of it but i have to go back before in the sense of I have to allow myself to realize there was a failure already here to achieve whatever I wanted to achieve. I'm not going to go through it in a sense. I'm going to have to go back and say, it's never going to be possible, but I can't do any different at the same time either. Mm. I, I have to acknowledge that then all these identities fail in some way and that's okay. That's I mean, what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, that's that idea of that, that form of failure, failure, accepted failure, right? This is the, and it's just something I've been reading about so much lately because I love it. It's, but the Catholic idea of hope, which is very much imbued in Tolkien's works of the only hope or the only movement from failure is when failure has been absolutely accepted and then you, and then you move on, right? So like all the battles and the overcoming of evil in Tolkien's novels, we, we as the reader can see that you know, we could turn to the end, right? Or something like that. But from the position of the people in it, they're, they're really dealing with it, something that's already a failure. So it's like, right, we've got the failure. We've failed, but we have to keep going on. Then we see what happens. Instead of sort of trying to somehow recalibrate it in some sort of way or working with it or something like that, it's like, 
Right now, now, no, we accept. There's been this change. There's been this theory. Now what? Oh, it's a, yeah. It's Samuel Beckett's fail better. We have to learn <laughs> to fail better. And I think, I think failing better is exactly as you just described it. We have to acknowledge that there was an absolute failure, but we have to go on. When was the and failure? Think- what was the failure? Do you, <laughs> yeah. do you see in time though, like a, a, maybe a, a period that would it, would it be, would it be this, like not, not taking either side? Uh, would it be the reformation? Would it be that split where there was this distrust of the, the sacramentals sort of thing? Do you mean, is that where we could locate like a prime moment of, yeah, uh, of yeah. recognizing our failure to see the failure? Or do you think it would be wrong <laughs> to sort of try and locate a prime moment? I'm always trying to do that. No, no, I don't think so at all. I think, I think actually finding, finding all kinds of moments throughout history or throughout our own personal lives uh, or, or in theoretical debates or, you know, that's where I tend to locate a lot of them. I think the Reformation is a prime moment of, of there was a real failure to see that that tension needs to be there and needs to to be maintained and and even cultivated at times we we have to say to ourselves at certain moments why has this tension appeared why does it seem like an impasse that cannot be resolved and we have to split for political reasons or whatever social reasons cultural and we need to understand better those dynamics uh, because there will be moments obviously like in totalitarian countries (laughs) historically where the oppression becomes so severe. There's going to be a push for, you know, a rebellion. People are going to say, I cannot do this anymore. And during the Reformation and, and certain moments leading up to it, at certain people felt too oppressed they, you know, this, or, or the corruption was too great or, you know, whatever. And instead of taking that seriously or listening as at certain moments in the Catholic church's life, they would have been well able to do mm-hmm. certain leaders happened to play in a certain way and it didn't work out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think it's unfortunate that we had to lead to certain splits, certainly. Um, but at the same time, they can be such a, a witness and a testimony to the fact that there are dynamics that have to be dealt with. We have to look at these. Um, I, 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 so I think the Reformation is a key moment where that failure comes to light. I also look at the theoretical one. This is one I've written about that I really find quite interesting and enjoyable. Um, there was this like little debate going on between Derrida and Agamben in their works where they were both accusing each other of trying to be sovereign. And <laughs> I find this very interesting because both of them are doing the same thing in mm. many ways. They're mm. both, it's like the pot calling the kettle black. They're both doing the same thing, but they're so committed to their discourses and to their critical apparatus in so many ways. It becomes very hard to get out of that and say, yeah, we're all doing this. This is what authors do. <laughs> we all want to have the most original position. We all want to say we were the first to understand this idea. Uh, And that's part of what it means to write something, Mm. to come up with a new idea, to say, I have a new perspective. But could we have also pointed to other examples or seen other ways to do this? Yeah, we could have done that too. (laughs) So that would be a, that would be a sort of a healthier way to on even, maybe even on an individual level to approach these, to approach this, this discussion of like, I'm not approaching the object with anything. I'm not trying to radicalize it, revolutionize it, or like, you know, vitalize it or neo icon nico neo iconography or something like that i'm in this sort of mess <laughs> yeah which goes back to your comment about disappointment and why i find that such a crucial thing like are we able to accept not just our failures but the disappointment that stems from those failures and can we say well you know what i've embraced my disappointment i'm at peace with it so i'm not needing to paper it over i'm not needing to say okay i'm going to make uh an absolutely joyous raptured moment or, or, you know, I'm going to come to this feeling of wholeness and completeness that will never be saturated with any sense of disappointment. No, I'm, I'm going to find that I sit in this disappointment and it enables me to get a whole different perspective. Maybe the one that I need on this situation to do something different, mm-hmm. to make change happen. I guess ultimately, I mean, this is stretching that, but beneath, but if we were just to take the sacraments beneath almost all sacraments is, is an air of disappointment. I mean, but obviously not not with maybe not with baptism not with marriage i'm not saying when you're married you're disappointed maybe that would be the, the one but baptism really this acknowledgement of being accepted into the grace of god but it's equally an acknowledgement of that you're you're not at the kingdom yet you're not you're you're still we still have to do the water and the the symbolic enacting of the baptism here via this material you know kingdom of man world via communion it's still a it's still a relationship, and uh, you know I think obvi- the the obvious one would be the the sacrament of confession. You know, it's not exactly an object, but it's like an experiential object, and ultimately that is one of disappointment. 
you are entering into something which is the ultimately the acceptance of your own disappointing of yourself and of of God. So there's this. I mean, so it's like a po- it's, you know super pretentious continental thing to say, but it's like a positive disappointment. Yeah, well, I, I don't disagree. I think, but I think even with baptism and marriage, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, always, I've always been drawn to those. You know, it's a very Pauline thing to do, like he does in Romans. Baptism is also a death. You know, your baptism is the your you're baptized into death with Christ. Mm-hmm. And I, I tend to view marriage as well, like having <laughs> kids. They're, they're like a death in a way. I mean, you die to a previous self. You mm-hmm. die to a previous life. And so I would even I would even focus on that and say there are, there's even in those moments which appear to be so joyous, there, there has to be an, a willingness to look at the negative side to it and say, well, it's also a death. It's a death to the life I used to live. It's a death to the life that was there before me. And I need to let go of that and acknowledge those disappointments. And I think that actually helps a person when they enter into baptisms and you know, new birth of children and, and also into marriages to not become unrealistic in the expectations, but to realize mm-hmm. I have to grieve and to mourn the passing of something else in order to move into this new state, which is wonderful and should be wonderful. But it also contains a trace of, of sadness and disappointment and a grief, which just sounds so strange maybe, no, but no, no, I, I think it's a... It, it, as a as a as an adult convert, you know, at twenty eight, you know, this this I'm fascinated with this whole idea of the new man, which, in a certain sense, as a, as a as a baby, as much as you know, that's that's better and better, you know, I, it's it's outside of time, so I can't really speak of it. But as a baby, you 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 haven't had a life to become a new man, right? So, but this idea, you know, this real mourning of you know, when, when you look back to now, when I look back and try to touch on memories, which were pre, it's like that it's a literally different person. And as you say, the other sacraments, whether it's marriage, then having kids and entering them into the church or whatever it is, entering into this deep relationship. It's like life is a series of series of deaths and births in relation to, 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 to other things. Completely, completely. Yeah, mm. I, I, I agree. <laughs> maybe that's why the the modern world sort of gravitates towards what many will might consider a sort of immaturity then there, there's no there's no fetishized if you wanted to put it that way fetishized line is drawn at any point that well their fetishes their fetishes as people commonly say instead of you could say that owning a home is the baptism you know that's the mark of becoming a new adult yeah i i share that concern in many ways because as I was saying a moment ago, if, if, if we could read a sacramental object as a historical, traditional way to try and deal with our disappointments and to deal with grief and the material realities that we are attached to, which open, up, open us up to mystery and keep them perpetually open, if fetishes become sort of a modern attempt to be open to that which we don't understand, but we're really struggling to do it and we're repeating constantly you know, the failure to actually find wholeness through those fetishes then yeah, I think there's the possibility for immaturity to be there is sky high. It's, it's such a, a risk that is taken. I don't think it means that we should be wholly dismissive of the, how do we put it, the, those, those individuals or groups or, tr- or new traditions that are trying to live without a religious sacramental past, um, they could run the risk of being incredibly immature. And they are, in a sense, immature because it's a new way of doing it. There could be, there could be over time, maybe this is where Charles Taylor gets it right in a secular age, there could be, you know, a willingness to find maturity in that and to recognize that even with our fetishes, uh, our material things, like you said, like buying a new home, mm-hmm. that even that is not going to be as fulfilling as we, we had hoped it would be. Um, and maybe we can learn to, to do that, but it's difficult. It's difficult. And I think it's going to be very hard to do for a lot of people because you do have these religious traditions, the sacraments that are trying to instruct people on how to deal with their failures and culturally, socially, and certainly economically, politically, it's very hard for people to deal with disappointments. Mm, um, mm. think of, I think of political right-wing movements right now where people are just trading on resentment and anger and saying, you don't have to actually face those things. You don't have to deal with them. Just put all that anger and channel that resentment into this political movement that will promise you wholeness. And then those movements become fetishized. They become, 
you know, it's, it's ideological where someone says, I'm going to overcome this anger, resentment, and disappointment once and for all by electing a sort of messianic leader who will put things right and take us back to where we need to be. But that's not the sense of the messianic mm. <laughs> that Christianity deals with, where facing the failure of the Messiah actually is the way to go forward. It's a very, very different logic that leads to a sacramental understanding. So, I, yeah, I think you're exactly right. That immaturity can translate into disastrous mm. and violent political forms or economic forms. Yeah, I guess it's the sort of almost apathetic acceptance that what's beneath your disappointment is entirely correct, right? So, like, if you're when you're a child, if you don't get the ice cream or whatever, you're disappointed because you didn't get it. And it's like a very clear relationship. Whereas, you know, as an adult, you have all these disappointments, but you don't question the object which would have supposedly you know, uh, fulfilled the disappointment, even though probably none of your desires have ever truly been fulfilled, right? Like, oh, this <laughs> this will be the book which scratches the itch. Um, and so yes. there's this, there's a set, you know, there's that sense of like, what, what, you know, of really digging in, I mean, it's a very banal thing to say, but really digging into the disappointment and saying, well, what, what truly is it? Why am I truly disappointed? And I guess Christianity in a sense is a, it's an ongoing relationship with disappointment because you're, you're always you you always will be until the end at least a world away um and as you say the the the, the passion is a is a positive failure right it that there had to be this absolutely awful thing this victory over death but it's not it's like a celebration of yeah celebration of disappointment and even we see this in the apostles right for for a long time afterwards in acts and the books the books after the passion they they're all a bit like why did that have to happen <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the figure of Peter is so emblematic of this. You know, not only does he continuously misunderstand what's really going on, he's, you know, and possibly betraying, you know, Christ at the same time. He's such a disappointment as a leader. I mean, he's just <laughs> it's pathetic. And yet, and yet somehow that disappointment translates into, no, that's the ideal. That's the ideal leader for this community. And how in the world are we supposed to understand that? It's it, not just paradoxical, it seems contradictory. But I think actually the lesson, as you're stating so well, the lesson is that we have to sort of embrace that this teaching of the sacraments is really a, a nonstop lesson in dealing with disappointment and failure. And if we don't understand that, we've missed the whole point of what's taking place here. So that's a crucial piece of what we need to understand or take away from this. Yeah. You know? mm. So it's a search, like it's a, it's a search for, its own, for its own sake, not for authenticity, not for the object, not even for the sacrament. It's a search just, the search is the search, you know, be disappointed. That's the advice. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and now we're going back to, uh, let's go full circle to your, back to Lord of the Rings. Uh, <laughs> you know, the person who's, who is able to say, I, I don't necessarily want the thing that gives me power, if I can let go of it, if I can get rid of the thing that I thought I wanted most, we know that's where true wholeness lies. And I think this goes back to the sense of the, the sacred and the secular. If I can let go of everything I thought was sacred, if I'm willing to do away with it, if I'm willing to let go in such a way that it's utterly transformative of me, well, that might actually be the sacred. <laughs> you know, and if and if that is, if that is where I encounter myself best and most authentically, by losing any sense of what it means to be authentic, then maybe that's what I need to listen to. So for me, this lesson or the catechesis of the sacraments is really a lesson in letting go of everything and discovering it once again, but in a completely different way. Uh, that, that's how I tend to read these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We seem to, we seem to have dug in deep into these issues very, very quickly. I mean, is there anything um, specific about your book that you'd, uh, you'd, you'd like to add that you feel we haven't touched on? Oh, I think you've done a great job of asking me questions to get to the heart of this. Um, <laughs> one of the things, one of the things was, uh, you know, this goes back to what I just said a moment ago. But I was also taking some notes on some some thoughts I had about this this book uh, in lieu of our interview coming up. Um, I think one of the big things that it makes me think about is that for a lot of religious people, they they want to understand their life as a constant search for the the holy thing the sacred thing and we want that and that becomes the core of religious practice but i think part of what i was getting in this book is that what does it mean to get to a place of saying there really is no content there is no truly holy object that i'm going to find but how can i let go of that and realize that in letting go of what those things that i thought were sacred were i actually rediscover 
a new relationship to these things, even these objects that make them perhaps holy, but in a very different way than I'd understood before. You know, and so it seems again like a real profanation. Like I'm, I'm really taking everything I had been deemed sacred and maybe seemingly to disrespect it, but actually it, it might return us to a different relation to them. And then I think we can begin to re- reread and reunderstand a lot of sacramental teachings about what it means to really encounter holiness. Uh, Jesus's comments about eating the bread of the presence, you know, this is something you're not supposed to touch or eat. And here he is eating it. Uh, Jesus being naked on the cross and, and being absolutely vulnerable to the world before him. And people saying, clearly, this is not, you know, the King of the Jews, clearly this is not a holy or sacred person, but something profound is coming out of all these desecrating moments that teaches us a new idea of what it means to go through holiness, sacredness, you know, et cetera. And that's why for me, uh, working as, you know, a theologian, technically speaking, (laughs) it's like, I'm always feeling like I'm never afraid to encounter what seems like the loss of religion, faith, the sacred, because in each of these moments, there's actually an opportunity to recreate and to re-encounter something anew. And if we're not living without fear, you know, and we're not ever going to be able to actually experience what those those moments of grace are in a person's life and, and how they may take shape and form in ways that we completely did not expect. But that's actually what we need to be walking toward, not away from. So uh, for me, it's a lot of people I work with <laughs> in the theology department are constantly like, these are scary times. We're losing we're losing all sense of the importance of religion. But I actually find it to be very, very exciting times. This is where we could begin to see things wholly anew. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's a good, a natural place to finish up. It's a more positive. It's a positive note. I think it's. Um, yeah, I mean, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's good. I've got <laughs> my my son was poking his head in the room, <laughs> looking looking for my attention. So no, that's mm-hmm. great. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate your, I, pre- I want to say I would appreciate your your questions and also your your responses. I think you're intuiting very very well what I was trying to get at. So it really helps to have someone asking in such a, a wonderful way to flush out these ideas even further. Well, yeah, it was a it was a fantastic book, uh, the, Th- the Fetish of Theology, Challenge of the Fetish Object to Modernity, and I'm assuming this will be found on Amazon and also via the publisher, Palgrave Macmillan. And whereabouts can we, and I know you've published many, many other books, whereabouts can we hear about uh, your own work? Um, well, these days it's all just go online and do your, your searches, right? Look mm. up <laughs> look up my name and you tend to find it. Um, but I, you know, I've had a, a book come out recently uh, this spring on Giorgio Agamben's Homo Satra series. I did a, a critical introduction and guide to that. And that book came out with Edinburgh University Press. And I also published a book last year on theological poverty in continental philosophy after Christian theology. And that came out of Bloomsbury last year. And that one, uh, I'm taking a lot of these themes we've even talked about today, this idea of the vulnerability and poverty and using a specific continental philosophical lens to elucidate it further. And I talk about those issues in that one as well. So I, I would say those are probably places to encounter a lot of what I'm doing, but in a, in a very interesting way, <laughs> and this is something I'm always doing too. A lot of these same ideas are explored again, but in a very different context in a book I did uh, uh, just a little bit over a year, year and a half ago called theology is autobiography where I talk about, and the subtitle is the centrality of confession relationship and prayer to the life of faith. But I'm reading different autobi- autobiographical accounts of people coming to faith, like Dorothy day and Mary Carr, but also, so Augustine and Tolstoy and talking about how reading their accounts and narratives of coming to faith also exposes us to a certain vulnerability and poverty within ourselves that is at the heart of what faith is really about. So even, even though this context seems so different, I don't really talk about continental philosophy and it. it's just, you know, going through autobiographical narratives and what, you know, describing their story of finding faith. I'm really still traversing the same grounds we've been talking about today and in our interview, just in a very different way. And those are based on my introductory lectures to intro to theology class. And yet, <laughs> so very easy to understand, I hope, but also I think very illuminating of some of these, these contexts as well. So those would be ones, I guess, where you could encounter more of what I'm up to. Cool. It, sounds, it all sounds fascinating. I'll be sure to put links in the description below. Um, yeah, Colby Dickinson, thanks very much. Thank you very much, James. This was a lovely, lovely time and good conversation.